so excited to have as many people here as we do today. Um, thank you, everybody, for your patience and understanding as the change in schedule for our speaker last month. We're really looking forward to having her in October. Um, hello, everybody out there. This is Cindy from the Parkinson's Resource Center here in Spokane. Um, uh, again, welcome back. Hopefully everybody is cooling off a little bit wherever you are and uh, that uh, your summer is going well. Uh, we have, um, well, he's been here before, but we have Dr. Jason Aldred with us today as our speaker. Just want to let you know to check out our calendar on the website uh, for the Parkinson's Resource Center, www.spokaneparkinsons.org. Uh, the Power Summit registration is up. I have one link to fix, and it should go right to the registration form. You can register online and pay online. The newsletter, um, due to some technical difficulties, mainly me, uh, went out, uh, actually it went out probably today. Um, in that, there is also the registration form uh, for the summit and all the information uh, through October for telehealth and a bunch of updates about April Parkinson's Awareness Month and things. So check out our website, check out our Facebook. We have a lot of things going on, even though it's quiet for summer. And I'm going to step aside and have uh, uh, Dr. Alder join us. Thank you. Oh, summit. Uh, the, the summit is September 12th, 12th. Saturday, September 12th. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So how many uh, remote sites do we have uh, logged in right now? What's the final tally? Okay. One, two, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Good. So we have 10 remote sites and then our local site here in uh, Spokane. I'm, for those of you that uh, I haven't met before, and mainly at the remote sites, I take it, although I probably know some of you all as well, I'm Dr. Aldrin. I'm a Parkinson specialist um, here in Spokane. Uh, I've been here about a year and a half, and uh, basically I spend all my, my working days seeing people with Parkinson's disease all day, every day, five days a week, and I go home on the weekends and come back again. And... Uh, so I did my training at OHSU uh, in uh, Portland and uh, a two-year fellowship in Parkinson's disease afterwards. And uh, I was in the Midwest for a while, then been back in the Northwest for about a year and a half. I'm very happy to be back out here. One of the things that I, I got uh, very interested in, in uh, Wisconsin, where I was previously before coming here, is I was working with a large, very large uh, clinic, kind of like Providence, something like, kind of like that, but in the Midwest that had a very large uh, network of uh, telemedicine sites and had been doing it for a long time, a very kind of well-oiled machine for telemedicine. So if you saw the New York Times, funny enough, if you ever catch that, look this and this Sunday's New York Times, I even think it was in the Spokesman yesterday, wasn't it? I believe in the Spokesman Review on Sunday, uh, article about uh, telehealth visits and, and how this is going to become part of the new normal. And I, th we'll t I want to have a little point to make about that. But, I, you know, what we're talking about now seems kind of it's not like, you know, a new medicine for Parkinson's. So how is this really relevant to many of you? Because a lot of the folks that come to these support groups and educational groups are some of the most well-informed people. And uh, really, one of the, the hopes with telemedicine is to kind of reach out and to kind of get uh, uh, those that don't have as is they're not as savvy maybe or um, as you all are or um, as able to to kind of search out kind of the best care uh, to give them access to care. So it's kind of a little different presentation, a different focus than I typically talk about, which is usually meds and stem cells and things like that, other things. So Parkinson's disease is increasing. The global burden of PD is increasing worldwide um, and access to care is a problem for a variety of reasons, distance, uh, disability, people with Parkinson's over time, not right away, but over time, if you live long enough, like I guess anything else, of course, you're going to have problems with mobility. Uh, and the cost of travel for many people is, is a real burden. So we hear about technology and technology to, you know, technology as a, as a means to an end. Well, you know, technology changes. We, we know that that for every uh, version or iteration of it, one technology, there's always a new one that's going to be coming, you know, down the road. Uh, and uh, we've we've kind of heard and seen Facebook or no the, the FaceTime the audiovisual type communications and most of us and, and 
even if you're retired now, probably in your working career have participated in audiovisual conferences, teleconferences, and things like that. So it's really not not a new technology. But uh, kind of making it work in a clinical practice has been a big problem uh, over the last uh, decade, even though the technology has been there. So I want to talk about how Parkinson's and uh, t technology is intersecting with telemedicine particularly. So telemedicine, you can think of it as healing at a distance. The same kind of thing that happens in clinic can easily happen from uh, your local uh, uh, doctor's office down the road or clinical site uh, that, that you could get by driving into a large city like Seattle, uh, Spokane, or Portland um, in the future. I think you'll be seeing more and more of that. Uh, this has really been fueled by rapidly falling costs of technology. In the past, in order to do what we're doing now with telemedicine, probably cost each site about twenty to thirty thousand dollars. That was in nineteen ninety dollars, you know. So, uh, really, uh, uh, pretty costly, and that has been a major barrier. Uh, docs couldn't just kind of flip open a phone and log on because the other person on the other end has to be scheduled, has to be knowledgeable about that technology, and you know, it has to. It can't just be like looking at their face and eyes, but we're actually interested in other movements, in other part of the body. So, so really, it's kind of changing. But now, one one thing I'll bring your attention to is who's ever heard of teleradiology? I, me neither. I've never heard of teleradiology. It, see, the the thing is with radiology nowadays, the way most radiology radiologists practice, probably ninety percent of all radiology films are not read at the site where the actual patient is. They're, uh, they're read in a different building, maybe across town. Many are read actually in another city. Some can even be read in another state. If you're a doctor and you're on call at night, uh, a lot of radiologists don't actually work nights. Very few do, in fact. But there are some radiologists that just work nights, and they're always on call at night or 24-7 to do these shifts from different sites they sign on with. And if you have a patient with a stroke and you need a uh, a very important head CT read right away to, to make a medical decision. You'll get a read back from a radiologist who's maybe in Nebraska, if we're in Wisconsin or in Washington State, because they happen to be the, tele the, the radiologist on. And we don't think of that as being that, as doctors at least, we don't think of that, about that as being that foreign. You know, maybe as patients that, that may come as a bit of a surprise to have the doctor kind of far away, but it's actually been done for over a decade, and it's a very widespread practice. And we just call that radiology. We don't call it teleradiology. And, and granted, radiology is a field that's extremely tech heavy, so the vast majority of what they deal with is technology based. But I think what we're, we're seeing is the traditional role of uh, healthcare kind of getting finally rolled into that. Not completely. I don't think what I'm talking about here should, should tell you that the doctor's visits are going away, but we now have. Because technology has gotten cheaper, uh, more reliable, and more accessible, uh, that, that we're going to have a whole new dimension to provide uh, advanced specialty care, or even primary care for that matter, to people that, that, that don't necessarily have, have that. Or, or even in a larger urban center, because of mobility issues, may not be able to have that. So this is what telemedicine kind of looks like when I'm doing it. I, I don't have gray hair yet. Um, but... Uh, this is sort of what it looks like. You're sitting at a, a, a table uh, with your desktop computer on, looking at a person at the far end. This is a person in a clinic uh, setting here on the computer screen. And basically, there's a webcam on them and a webcam on you so you could see each other, you know, kind of get the nonverbal communication that you might get uh, in a regular clinic visit. I mean, that's, that's kind of important, you know, not to just make a call and hear a voice, but to actually kind of see what the doctor is demonstrating. The way that we do the exam is very visual, as I'll talk about. But this is really what the technology looks like. You know, on my talk today on telemedicine, it's actually, uh, it involves technology, but a lot more of it is about negotiating kind of, you know, with other clinics, other health systems. There's such fragmentation of care in our country. You have to actually navigate the the, the battles that, to, that are fought to set this kind of thing up are, are actually navigating different health networks, health systems. For, for us, for example, we've been fortunate to stay within the Providence and INH, INHS in the Northwest West Health Services Network to do this. But, but it, the technology is this easy. It's this easy to make telemedicine happen for everyone, even in your own home. But there, there are barriers to that that we'll talk about. And it's, uh, it's, it's not the technology. So why is, technology, why is telemedicine and Parkinson's kind of unique? Why is there interest particularly in this for Parkinson's versus multiple sclerosis or versus Alzheimer's disease or versus 
um, epilepsy, for example. Well, movement disorders are highly audio and visual. They're, it's a very, very AV focused kind of condition. Uh, when you're a, a Parkinson's fellow training, you carry a reflex hammer and a video camera in your doctor's bag or in your white coat. You walk around with your little video camera everywhere, and that's what you keep your patient videos on. Um, not so much for run-of-the-mill type stuff, but someone comes in with an unusual condition, you videotape it because if you try to describe kind of the aspects of a movement disorder to someone. Well, they were shaken. Well, how much? Well, they're medium. Well, and a doctor say on this another doctor, we both immediately start kind of showing them. Well, kind of like this. How bad was their dyskinesia? I don't know if you can put the camera on me for just a minute here. So, all right, I'll step in frame. They'll say, well, they're shaking kind of like this, as opposed to saying shaking medium, and then they immediately can kind of get the idea. How about their dyskinesia? Well, it wasn't that bad. It was kind of like this. Well, that's pretty bad. That's a lot of movement. I'm like, well, it's not to me. Well, you know, seeing, seeing is believing, uh, I guess. And so uh, being able to visually uh, lay eyes on, you know, what is going on with the patient with Parkinson's disease is huge. It's a very big deal. If you can just see it, that's, that's uh, one, of the biggest part, uh, one of the biggest aspects of learning what to do next with medication, DBS programming, rehab recs, whatever. Okay, you can go back to this slide. Um, so keen observation of movements of the hands, arms, legs, gait, posture, facial expression, voice volume, and tone. Uh, this is just part of our everyday practice. This is what we do day in, day out. Uh, and these high-definition web cameras particularly, uh, th these are uh, probably the second version of the iPhone was really the first high-def web camera that be became an everyday use. And ever since then, these, these uh, devices have gotten better and better. Uh, this is really sufficient to capture nearly all key aspects of the examination and, and Parkinson's uh, for, for someone with Parkinson's disease. Also, the, the progressive nature of movement disorders, not just PD, but movement disorders in general, uh, limits mobility. And the, the patient and caregiver are often less likely to want to come in as often as needed, maybe at the time when they're in the most need. And they'll go to seek out care with primary care doctors, which is very appropriate. You know, your local primary care doctor should always be involved in any, you know, major change in transition of your care if you're really struggling a lot. So I think that's a good idea. But but then again, trying to, to get some specialty knowledge uh, involved to uh, improve and maybe uh, prevent a hospitalization or prevent a fall, a medicine complication, something like that. You know, e even people in Spokane or uh, urban areas will sometimes not come in because it's just too difficult, it's stressful, uh, psychologically they're kind of at, at their end and, and don't want to you know, come in right at that moment until they feel better. Well, hopefully they will get through that and feel better, but I always worry, you know, if they someone's not coming in, we add them to the schedule, they don't show up, you're kind of like, oh my gosh, are they in the, you know, so to be able to just beam in automatically like that would be really wonderful. So really, there's not a lot of uh, Parkinson's specialists around. Uh, there is a number in Seattle and Portland, but there's just myself and Dr. Manick are the only two between uh, Minneapolis and Seattle uh, here in Spokane covering a very large area. So uh, telemedicine has really been around for Parkinson's for, for quite a while. Uh, there was a, a first research study was done in, in Parkinson's and telemedicine uh, about uh, 20 uh, years ago by Gene Hubble. And since then, uh, there's, there was a one study 10 years after that showing that, yes, it's feasible, people like it. And they both sort of said that, yes, it's, we, can, we can do it and people like it. But it just didn't catch on. It's like one of those things. You know, you can invent a great device, a great technology, but if it doesn't catch on, it has to catch on and be user-friendly. And other people have to want to do it for it to be widespread. Otherwise, you're just pushing a rock uphill and you don't really get anywhere. Um, so even though it's been a positive experience, it's taken some time to, to break into the mainstream. Multinational studies have also shown that telemedicine uh, for Parkinson's patients by specialists results in increased access to care and also higher quality and fewer hospitalizations and fewer complications. So the here and the now, this is where we are. Believe it or not, at this point in time, almost 3 billion people uh, across the world have broadband access. That's the kind of access that you need for audiovisual transmission from any, any point in time um, or any place in town or wherever you're at and w whenever. Uh, 1.4 billion have smartphones with video conferencing uh, capabilities. So you could actually do with your own smartphone what we're talking about doing with these more sophisticated, in some cases, more sophisticated devices. And really, you know, we're seeing that, that technology now finally is cheap enough. It's widespread enough. In other words, people have this stuff already. You don't have to go out and get something. 
You don't have to go and get a, uh, like a, a walker or a wheelchair. You don't have to go out and get a DME order for like a special device to do this. You kind of already have it. So part of the beauty of this and where I think it's interesting is kind of leveraging stuff that's already there. That's always what I've been more interested in. It's not trying to come in and reinvent the wheel, but let's see what's already there and let's try to leverage that kind of system to make it work. And that's what that's been the biggest barrier for telemedicine so far. So I wanted to to um, review a couple of uh, international efforts and show you guys how this is being done across the world and then how we're doing it here in America. So the Movement Disorder Society is the 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 professional group for Parkinson's research and scholarship and stuff like that. And they've sponsored a uh, project to educate local healthcare providers about Parkinson's in Cameroon. And so a lady named Esther Kubo, who's uh, based out of uh, Madrid, Spain, is on is the lead on this and has been doing a number of videos, case reviews, Q&A sessions to just a general neurologist and primary care doctors in the area uh, in Cameroon to improve the their knowledge of Parkinson's. That's kind of a doctor to doctor piece, kind of uh, not, I guess, like the, the PRC telehealth network, but kind of like that, except instead of patients on the far end, it would be providers. Um, in Nigeria, there is one uh, movement disorders, one Parkinson's doctor for the whole country, and very limited ability to meet demand. Pretty much anyone who shows up there is seen, and they stay until everyone's gone, uh, and she kind of works with a variety of other assistants. Um, right now, uh, we're working with the technology that's called Store and Forward Telemedicine. It's a pre-recorded presentation of the doctor standing by the patient, telling them the medical history, and then uh, uh, showing parts of the exam, having the patient walk. They're recording it, uploading it onto a server, which we're housing in, uh, in Toronto. And um, I'm one of uh, uh, five, uh, five people involved with this, uh, so there's... So experts, an expert in uh, Madrid, Toronto, San Francisco, here in Spokane, and then Philadelphia. And we're reviewing, uh, kind of taking, taking call, if you will, <laughs> reviewing every, uh, every five cases that comes in from, uh, from Nigeria to uh, formulate an opinion. And we type back a note saying, well, this is, this is what we think the diagnosis is. We, yes, we agree or don't agree with your diagnosis. This is what we think the diagnosis is and, and what you might do with it. And, and so gives that person and those other assistants that she has kind of access to specialty care uh, via the store and forward. It's all pre-recorded. And the beauty of this is with Nigeria, I don't know if you're keeping up with some of the news there, but uh, you know things kind of come and go in terms of their ability to uh, upload things or upload speeds change based on their infrastructure at the time. And, uh, and this way, if they want to upload it overnight, it can take 12, 18, 20 hours or whatever to upload. And then you have the file on the server, and we're able to access it then at our own whatever our own time is, so it gets away from the scheduling aspect of this. And this actually has been done in Canada and also in Alaska for, uh, for quite a while, kind of, kind of like this. This is called store and forward technology, or asynchronous. So one side is doing it on their time, and another side sees the patient. It's all pre-recorded. So you don't have the ability to, to uh, you know, kind of ask questions and that sort of thing. You do lose that, but you're able to see a nicely done presentation and then get a, uh, comments back or maybe follow-up questions on what to ask the patient. Uh, back and uh, provide specialty care there. So it's kind of an experiment that we're doing on behalf of the Movement Disorder Society that's funding that. Canada. So our neighbors to the north uh, are extremely advanced and probably, the, well, without a doubt, uh, the most advanced uh, telemedicine network on, on Earth. Um, it's actually, uh, it, you know, it's kind of, they call it telemedicine still, but it's kind of about like the joke about radiology. It's so much a part of the way some of the doctors do their practice. It's just like, you know, just they're oh what are you doing? Well I'm seeing patients today, and it just happens to be over the telemedicine mostly or a regular day in clinic. But uh, over 300,000 people in uh, Ontario had uh, healthcare over uh, telemedicine uh, in, in the last year, and over 60% of that was for mental health. That's actually another specialty that's uh, beginning to well is really growing a lot in telemedicine is with behavioral health because you're probably aware there are some areas that have a lot of behavioral health practitioners, not many but some. And then others, most of, most of the nation, in fact, doesn't really have enough behavioral health uh, practitioners around. And so this is a way to kind of get around that. Uh, and, and you're seeing that, in particular in Canada, it's really taken off. In Canada, there's the same uh, reimbursement as a face-to-face -face visit, but believe it or not, they actually give the providers, they pay them slightly more to do it to encourage them to use this. And I think this is an interesting point to come back to because... Well, think what you want, but uh, those are one of the things that will, will help other people that are less interested get motivated. So if you're trying to motivate people, money doesn't make them do everything. But, you know, if you could 
make it easy, make it useful, make it so that their patients uh, are satisfied with with this service. And then, you know, if it was if it, there's some motivator, I think the Canadians were smart about it, and it's really caught on. Uh, unlike the U.S., there's no requirement for licenses from different provinces. So you can be in Ontario and see a patient in Nova Scotia, uh, see a patient, you know, in the Yukon, and it doesn't really matter. Here in the U.S., I actually have to have a license for every state that I want to, that where a patient's physically at to see for telemedicine. So if a guy is from Pendleton and wants to drive up to Othello to have telemedicine, we can do that. That's fine. But if they want to do it in, in Oregon, even if it's in their home, in theory, I have to have a license for that. So we have lots of regulations and lots of – so you think of Canada as being a pretty heavily regulated place, but they've been smart enough to kind of get around that, I think. So I, I think it's a, a good thing to not have to have a, a specific to, – to, to maybe get a waiver for a license for telemedicine. I think maybe having a license to see patients you know, in the state, if you're seeing them traditionally, that's fine. That's been that way for years. But for telemedicine, I think there's that, that's a barrier that we could maybe do away with that would really help. Um, so in Markham, Ontario, over 600 PD patients are seen yearly by uh, Dr. Gutman, who's one of my colleagues up there um, in, in his center. So that's really a, six, that's a lot of the uh, telemedicine uh, uh, visits. And 90% and of, of those patients uh, thought that telemedicine visits were the same or better in quality compared to the routine visit. And that's kind of interesting. We usually don't think of telemedicine as being better. I try to sell my patients on it saying, just give it a try if you don't like it. You can always come back to see me in person. I've never had a patient go through a telemedicine visit that wanted to come back to see me in person, not one. Which at first, I was glad about, but it was a little bittersweet. But uh, ultimately, when I, I kind of saw it through their eyes, I, I could see why. And I think it's a testament that, you know, that you can still have a human, that human contact and interaction and still be a good listener and still, you know, convey... Uh, your your concerns to the doctor, and the doctor can still you know get get the idea back about you know what it is that you need to do and with your treatment regimen that, that you know that you've been heard and and you know your concerns are, are understood even though it's remote and it's not the same as being there in person. Uh, but yeah, it's really been I, I can agree with that experience from that rating there. So in China, over two million people uh, have Parkinson's. This is twice as many as in the U.S. 70% of those people are in the rural areas. Even 50% of those in urban areas are not diagnosed. This is in China, okay? By 2030, a half of the world's population will live in China. So this is this is really kind of a an, an incubator for the rest of the world's problems. Someone could say if we could kind of figure out how to help China uh, through this, that maybe we could use those ideas everywhere else as well. And uh, there are very few neurologists in general in China, uh, and those that are, you know, the Chinese have, many of them have become very affluent quickly over the last decade or two, and, and mainly it's the most affluent people that are uh, able to get access to, to medical care, and the middle class and other, others are not really able to, uh, to, 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 get that ac to get access, so there's a real, real need there as well. The PD specialist there sees about 80 patients daily. So I see, on my busy days, I see about 20. So that's, uh, I don't know. I don't know how you could do that and, and really still get the job done well. Uh, certainly, I can listen to the kind of concerns that I want to hear from my patients to get a good view, get what I feel is like is a complete view. Even, I mean, even, even now in our practice, I, I feel like uh, most of the time I would like to spend more, patient, more time with our patients than we're able to even now. So I couldn't imagine you know, multiplying that fourfold. Um, so there's really limited ability for in-depth management for these patients. The MDS has funded, the Movement Disorder Society has funded a project to train general neurologists to see patients via telemedicine and compare that to routine care with just their primary care doctor. So this is care by a neurologist versus care by a primary care uh, doctor uh, uh, because there's, although there's not many neurologists, there's still more than there are Parkinson's specialists. And they're going to compare that and you know, try to make a case, I think, in China that, you know, that at least could work. And uh, trying to get more data from different environments is a very powerful motivator for change here or, or anywhere else, the, the more variety of data that you have. And that's kind of what's driving that project. So the Netherlands. The Netherlands has a really very well-developed um, national health system. However, uh, like most national health systems, actually they do suffer from rationing of care. 
uh, due to high cost, so costly specialists, costly procedures, and uh, limited resources. Even you know there, like most places, there's a relatively limited number of uh, uh, doctors and specialists and therapists and, and whatnot. So they've developed this uh, network called Parkinson Net, this kind of group. And it's a multidisciplinary program to keep PD patients in their homes and reduce complications. And so what they're doing is they have this Parkinson's Healthcare Finder used to find PD experts in different fields, kind of an online tool, kind of like if you ever use MJF Trial Finder, the Michael J. Fox Trial Finder, kind of like that, but for clinicians. And they have this very unique kind of self-monitoring web application. It's got some uh, devices and sensors like the iPhone, things like that, that you can put in and uh, attach to and, and kind of give some feedback data as to, to the team care coordinator, what, what the patient's doing. Um, also, there's some motivation back from internet back to you uh, via the, the um, care coordinator uh, to do more gaming, home training on your treadmill, the Wii uh, PD uh, network. They have this uh, network of, uh, it's like the, the Nintendo Wii is this video game system where you can do all of the bowling and table tennis and all these sorts of things. And so they have a special national we network for Parkinson's and, and the Netherlands where they're competing against each other all the time. It's kind of funny. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess the upside to this is a lot of times people are, are kind of getting the motivation from the spouse to get up and do more activity, to do their exercises. And this sort of is the same, well, it's kind of being more objective. It's probably more effective coming from the doctor, possibly. And the spouse doesn't have to be the one complaining to the other person, well, you need to do this. You know, it's kind of coming more from like the healthcare team, which I think is kind of nice. Also, a way to look at med compliance. So there's a web inter interactive med dispenser, which is really very interesting. It kind of attempts to check on compliance there and uh, reduce medicine errors. But really what this is kind of doing is, is like a tightening this web of this network between patients and their support networks and even their providers, kind of making it so people don't fall through the cracks as easily. So it's not exactly telemedicine, but this is more kind of a, a loose application of kind of a, a an, an internet network technology that, that uh, keeps people from falling through the cracks. And then lastly, uh, in the United States. So telemedicine for Parkinson's disease is occurring in the United States uh, at a few places. Uh, there's two VA sites, uh, one in um, uh, Northern California, uh, or one in Pennsylvania and one in Northern California. There's Kaiser in Northern California, University of Rochester in New York State, and then actually our clinic, uh, Northwest Neurological in Spokane. We're the only uh, four or five sites doing telemedicine for Parkinson's in the U.S. right now. Um, and at our, at our site, I wanted to add a little plug. We're, we're funded by a, a generous grant from the Parkinson's Resource Center to make that happen. So thanks to them for that. It's kind of what the, the money that you guys uh, give goes for is to get those thing, things started up. Um, so to tell you a little bit about uh, Connect Parkinson's a research study, then I'll go back into our actual boots on the ground telemedicine practice. Uh, we're we're uh, part of uh, the largest ever randomized controlled clinical trial for telemedicine for any, any condition, not to mention Parkinson's. And what the aim of this project is, is to compare PD patients who receive routine clinical care in their clinic with those who receive in-home telemedicine, okay? So, uh, of course, every group knows what they're getting, but they're randomized, so we don't get to pick it. So, e ideally, they should be relatively equal and comparable. And really, the, the outcome, so what we're looking at is pretty modest. We're trying to look at, is this feasible? Did it work? Or did it not work? Did it fail miserably? Uh, patient and provider satisfaction. And, and look at how severe is PD in each group. Maybe make some attempt. This isn't one of the main measures, but make some attempt to see, you know, perhaps was it really worse than the telemedicine group? Was it worse than the, um, uh, the routine clinical care group? You know, that would at least be a start, but it's not really geared to look at that in detail. And these are the sites uh, nationwide. So us in OHSU in the Pacific Northwest, UCSF, Kansas, uh, Baylor, Penn, Harvard, uh, Park Nicolet up in Minneapolis, and Duke are some of the, the Miami or some of the main sites here, Hopkins on the East Coast. So we're kind of part of a nice group there, uh, uh, get a national representation of how different uh, practice patterns might emerge too through different parts of the country because a lot of the barriers with telemedicine have to do with what kind of health system you're in. If you're in a 
you know, like our center is the only small private practice group. Uh, the others are university groups. There's a few that are kind of large hospital systems that aren't exactly academic groups. And so th those sorts of little things actually can have different ways those systems work that can make telemedicine more or less feasible. And we're also hoping to learn a little bit about that. So just a bit about telemedicine at Northwest Neurological. Uh, so this, the idea here is to do telemedicine uh, in our clinic to a remote clinic. Uh, current patients have the option of scheduling a follow-up uh, visit at four sites in Washington State so that have been selected based on our census for having higher concentration of PD patients, but also in rural areas. The key thing here, and the reason we won't do this in Spokane right now, for example, or, you know, Coeur d'Alene, or, well, I have to have a license there, um, would be that, uh, that, that basically Medicare defines uh, that you have to be in a health provided shortage area. So health provider shortage area, or HIPSA, is what Medicare defines as being uh, having few enough doctors that you're underserved. So if you're in a HIPSA, uh, if a patient goes to a clinic in that site and gets telemedicine, Medicare will pay for it. Now, doctors, we, as doctors or health providers, we don't get paid more, we don't get paid less. It's the same amount. It's the Medicare, standard Medicare fee for seeing a patient. So, you know, that's, so you're not, you know, my argument to other doctors is that you're not losing any money on it. Let's just go ahead and, and do it and try to make this more widespread. But it's, it's more challenging than that. Uh, but, but you don't, you know, lose out anything on it, which is kind of nice to know. Now, this is uh, our, our immediate catchment area. We've uh, selected, I've been working with uh, Inland Northwest Health Services, which has been just amazing getting this up and running. And, uh, and the, the guys at Providence have been pretty, very helpful, too. Um, there's Spokane, of course, and you can see, uh, I don't think I have all of them on the map, but uh, we've got uh, Chuila's, Chuila's up here, roughly, but north of Deer Park, Colville, Colville area. Colville, we've got uh, north, Cassidy. right? New, or, New, or Newport's there. Right. Newport, sorry, not Northport. And and then uh, we've got Othello down here. So we kind of have here spread up kind of to the north and uh, and west our, uh, our clinics. Uh, I do an outreach clinic in Pullman. So the idea is to try to draw a semicircle around and, you know, in, in increase the catchment area. Oh, Newport, I have it up there. Yeah. Um, so, so those are our... Uh, first four uh, pioneering sites uh, that were chosen because uh, uh, as far as rural areas, we have a lot of people coming from those places to Spokane uh, for care. And so we chose to make uh, relationships with those local clinics and work with the Providence Network uh, since I'm already credentialed there to kind of get that up and running. Um, and again, the advantages here we hope for these people will be uh, less travel time, uh, less cost associated with travel, lower risk of hazards and poor weather. If you're, you're older and you have Parkinson's and you have poor eyesight, I mean, those things tend to go together. Older people get Parkinson's in general and you have poor vision, you know, maybe slower reaction time. So weather can be, we can sometimes see a seasonal drop off. You don't really see a lot of people not showing up for visits until the winter and those snow days come and all of a sudden the phones light up and we're not going to be able to make it in. Well, you know, and we certainly get, get those folks back in, but, uh, you know, not having to miss those appointments to begin with would be nice as well for them if they could just go a short distance. And the other thing, too, is to keep the care close to home. So what we've also, this is just kind of, this is letting you guys in on the inner, the inner workings of how this, is, this relationship, I think, can work is uh, we, we keep the, the care closer to where the patient's getting it already at their local uh, uh, hospital center, at the, whether it's Bonner General, whether it's... Uh, you know, uh, the Colville Hospital or out in Othello. Uh, they, you know, you, if you get your care close to home, your labs are there. If, if I think you need an imaging study and I order that, it's going to be there accessible by your primary care doctor. You know, really it decreases a fragmentation of care. And, you know, I think it, it, what we'll see down the road is you'll see fewer and fewer people traveling into bigger cities for a lot of their care and having to travel back. I think you're going to see a lot of it because of the technology we have kind of moving out more into the community, which is a good thing. That's a very good thing. If it's done well, it's a good thing. So we'll have a lot of that uh, uh, kind of ancillary services and other testing and stuff kept closer to home. So that, this is kind of how this is going to work at our clinic. We've got our very first patient we're doing tomorrow. <laughs> so so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see. But this is the idea. We're going to schedule a telemedicine follow-up at checkout. Um, come to the rural clinic 15 to 30 minutes prior to the visit. The medical assistant will log on to the computer with an enabled webcam and audio. And then the visit begins with discussion and examination with recommendations. 
orders for care and instructions are then faxed to the clinic uh, for local scheduling and the patients to take them home. The whole idea for, for this process is to make this minimally disruptive, uh, to try to leverage the resources of the clinic that is already, you know, that's already going on. We want to try to disrupt their process minimally, kind of come into their clinic with the telemedicine equipment and just being kind of attached to the computer and letting them go about their workflow. We'll kind of do things very similar to how we do it now. Uh, the patient leaves the office with a written uh, instructions for how you know they should be taking their medicine or what changes there were, physical therapy orders and whatnot. And so really we try to make this easy, uh, as easy as possible. And then the idea is the patient likes it, the staff, the clinic on the other side say, well, that's not that big of a deal. That actually, we just did telemedicine. It wasn't that hard. You know, one of the big barriers is this notion that there's technology, it's hard to do, there's so much, you know, to, to, to keep you from doing it. But what my, I hope to show and hopefully publish on this is that it's really very feasible to, to do. So that's basically my uh, talk today. I did want to end on one quick, we can get it running. Brian, are you there? Try to. It may not work with it hugged up to the or plugged up to the telemonitor, but I want to try to show you guys what it would. Uh, oh, I don't have wireless here. No wonder. Is there a St. Luke's Wi-Fi I could log into real quick? Yeah, I, I, I always have your wireless on here. <laughs> the there's, a, there's, there's Wi-Fi on this one already run. Is there? I mean, but you have a password or anything? It's just the generic login. So you, you guys don't have Wi-Fi? Uh, well, I could use my Xfinity password. Um, so, I for example, just, yeah. Xfinity, which is the, the Comcast cable platform for wireless, uh, you actually can... Um, I mean, just a G. So that's, there's my personal hotspot. Oh, cool. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I didn't. Brian and I just discussed this a minute before we came. We started this uh, presentation, so I wanted to try and try to do it on the fly if I could to show you how easy it might be. Oh. Uh, I'm logged on to Cindy's. Oh, uh, okay, well. So maybe a little slower because we're logging on through Cindy's phone. And there he is. So this is logged on via Cindy's iPhone. Okay, this is our wireless technology. And this is Brian. Who Brian want to take a bow? Oh, can't see him. Oh, geez, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, we'll get it. Well, it's not show, it doesn't want to show up there for some reason. I'm seeing on my screen. He's on my screen. Oh, well, set your screen. Watch your coffee and all this. All right. What's that, Brian? I got your volume on now. Where, where, what were you saying? You're not on the. Yeah, you're not on the big St. Luke's uh, projector. Can I? Sh I'd have to share you, wouldn't I? Oh, gotcha, gotcha. I am. So if you guys can see uh, Brian over there, good. I think they can see you. Okay, cool. So uh, the way this will kind of work is uh, kind of work. <laughs> and we just set this up on the fly. Is I can track Brian around. I can move my camera, and uh, let's see. Let's see. I don't, I've never asked him. Stand still, Brian. Let's see what the color of your eyes are. I wanted to show you guys this so you can get the, the idea of how, how good our resolution really can be. 
with this so we can kind of zoom in and out and move around and and then uh, get you in and out of frame and you want to go ahead and walk to the your right Brian walk back and forth good arm swing no hand trimmer while walking no shuffling steps okay thanks a lot for being the last minute guinea pig I appreciate that oh you won all right <laughs> But, you know, really, uh, we literally put that together a, uh, sorry, we, we put that together about a, a minute before this presentation started. I just called Brian on the phone and said, hey, let's hook this up and get it going. And it was, that's how I do things, kind of seat of the pants sometimes. But, uh, you know, so, so really, the, the idea here is that technology isn't so much of the barrier uh, as much as just kind of the... Uh, the, the, the willingness to kind of you know push something like this new forward and realize that even if you're in an urban area you, down in the future you may be in a situation where it's hard to get out it's hard to get around so we're planning now so that we could uh, uh, get to patients when they're most in need and also uh, those that right now that maybe could get in but it's a long distance a lot of mountains between here and there uh, to, to get them access to care now so that's that's the bottom line of my presentation, kind of improving access to care, uh, improving quality regardless of the time and distance and, you know, mobility issues down the road. So any questions? I had a question from North Valley Hospital. If you need your password, it is. <laughs> if you're in the room, that'll work. And I'd be particularly interested in hearing from our remote sites. Because uh, one of the things I've, uh, well, definitely one of the next things on the agenda is to get a, a license in Montana and Alaska, uh, if there's interest, uh, to, to do this uh, from those sites. Montana, just to tell you a little bit of background, I won't go into detail, Montana is pretty progressive. They, they have a uh, specific telemedicine license a doctor can get because they've been dealing with issues of space for quite a long time, and it's not a new, new thing for them. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I think Alaska is uh, somewhat similar. Okay, so speaking of Alaska, we'll start uh, with our uh, satellite sites, um, Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, how many people today, and um, do you have any questions? Is that Alaska? Hello there. And if I miss you as I'm going down the list, just make sure that you hop in at the end and tell me if I've missed a site. Okay. Thank you, Alaska. It's good to have you. Billings, Montana. Can I have Dr. Al D R E? Or how do you A L D R E D. Oh. Thank you, no. <laughs> Thank you. I will jump to uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I'm trying to unmute it. Okay, we have four people here. We have one question. Okay. Go ahead. What about Idaho? <laughs> Rather than Montana and also uh, Alaska, we can be as remote up here. Well, well, Coeur d'Alene's pretty, pretty close relative to some of these other places with a nice it's, interstate. It's, it's different state, different country. I hear you. I hear you. No, it's uh, – you, you know, uh, I won't go into details, but uh, there um, – I, 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 Idaho has some unique barriers uh, in terms of medical practice with uh, telemedicine. That's as far – that's as much as I'll say about it. But if you're interested, you certainly might look into it a bit more. But there's been a lot of barriers that Idaho's put in place against having telemedicine done. Uh, so uh, I would definitely am extremely interested to have a lot of patients from Sandpoint, um, north of Sandpoint. Uh, uh, you know, there's a VA clinic here that, uh, you know, sometimes I have to have them write my prescriptions that are issued from Spokane VA. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, I mean, the VA is a unique situation, and believe it or not, the VA is probably the best suited organization in the entire country to be doing to be yes. doing telemedicine. Um, the, the, the Portland VA has done speech telemedicine previously, but I'm not aware of any of the other. I don't think Portland's doing. They're the main Parkinson Center in the Northwest for a VA, and I don't think they're doing any telemedicine right now. Or are they? I mean, I may they I may be unaware of that, but they do a monthly class education program like this, or they have been. Uh -huh. yes. I don't know if they're still doing it every month, but um, I don't know if they do the individual telemedicine. Yeah, I don't think they do a telemedicine doctor to patient visit, but. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, and I support that. I'm not saying I wouldn't get an Idaho license, but uh, you know, we're rel you were trying to get to places that are further away, uh, furthest away to begin with, and then kind of work work in more. And and then I'm hoping that the Iowa, uh, that the sorry, the I the Idaho legislature have an Iowa medical license too. I'm hoping that the uh, Idaho legislature will sort of kind of kind of get a little more uh, on board with telemedicine by the time we would do that. Because there's, there's been some. I've been asking not to drive in Spokane. Or What's on that? the freeway. I've been asked not to drive in Spokane or on the freeway. You're, you're, so you're I'm, I'm uh, homebound. Absolutely. Absolutely. Your point is exactly the reason why we need to, to, to get this going sooner rather than later. Uh, you know, you're able-bodied. You can do much of what you want to do, but there are key things like driving. And if you don't have someone else around to take you to doctor's visits, it's a problem. It's a major burden. I mean, it is a real issue. And and then you make it in, you know, but not maybe as often as you would like or need to if something comes up. So no, I think your point about you know not being told you shouldn't drive on the busy freeway or interstate and with Parkinson's is, is a really good point, and it gets at the whole idea of of access to care, even in a town like Coeur d'Alene, which is a you know, sister city to Spokane, it's a fairly big big town itself, uh, but yet, you know, you have a hard time getting to the slightly larger city where there's PD specialists. It's a, it, it highlights this, this notion that even in a larger urban area, you can still have problems getting access to care. So yeah, very good point. Okay, thank you, Coeur d'Alene, for being there and for your question. Colfax? Colville, Providence, Mount Carmel. I, 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 that's one of our telemedicine sites is Colville. So <coughs> if there's any interest, we're coming to a place near you. Lewiston, Lewiston, Clarkston. We have eight, eight of us here and no questions. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. You're welcome. Moses Lake. Yeah, we have three questions. There's nine of us here. And there's nine. Thank you. Go ahead with your questions. Yeah, uh, this sounds like it's about the same thing as Skyping. It is. So will that work? Skyping will work. Uh, it has to be HIPAA compliant. That's something that more and more uh, uh, AV softwares are. I actually heard recently that fa the new version of FaceTime was. I don't know if Skype is HIPAA compliant. Again, it's there put in place for your privacy, but it is kind of a barrier it's coming when it, when it comes in between patient care sometimes or things like this. But the thing is with you guys, for example, we can't do this from – home or just anywhere and have your insurance cover it. So if you want insurance to cover it and Medicare to cover it, you have to go to a HIPSA. So if you're in Moses Lake, for example, how far are you guys from Othello? 20 miles. So that's the thing. You can live in Moses Lake and drive to Othello, which is in a health provider shortage area. Moses Lake's not. Uh, Othello is. And uh, you can go to Othello and we can do tell we can do this and Medicare will cover it. Um, one of the ideas behind the Connect Parkinson's trial for in-home telemedicine is to kind of show the CMS, which is Centers for Medicare Services, and they determine you know, what they'll cover and what they won't payment-wise is to say that, look, patients didn't hate this. They, they like it. Doctors like it. Let's, let's make this a, a reimbursable option that, that we could do from home. 
And, and that's really, I think, where we would all like to see this go next is to just do this from the convenience of your own home on your own time. And sometimes, like, show us the areas in your home. You know, like, where is it that you're freezing more? You know, you can show that with, with a, you know, telemedicine, whereas you, in clinic, people always do better in clinic than they do at home. I don't know if you guys have experienced that or not, but all my patients are better in clinic. Like, I'm not usually like this. I'm usually much worse. I'm like, I believe you. I believe you. Yes, everyone says that. Um, um, so, so yeah, that's a little bit of a long-winded answer, but um, did it answer your question? Yes. Yeah, you, uh, you can use Skype um, in theory. Another question is, uh, what is the cost to the patient for these visits? The, the cost is the same as what it would cost uh, with Medicare. So, you know, if you have uh, whatever your copay is, if there's a copay with that, it'd be the same. If not, uh, it would be nothing. It just depends on how much you're <laughs> It, the Medicare handles it like a standard visit, no extra. If one thing we're talking about doing is setting up a, a concierge service, I'll just throw this out there. I'd be curious to hear everyone's thoughts so that we would uh, still charge the same amount that Medicare would, but you'd have you'd pay out of pocket for it as opposed to have Medicare pay. It's not a lot. I mean, it's, it's like $100. And, uh, and, uh, but for a visit, you know, for a quarterly visit. And then uh, folks coming from Montana – or other places would just maybe pay that instead. It's got to be cheaper than gas in a room if you're coming from Billings, which some pay, we have patients coming from Billings and Helena sometimes to see us and Wenatchee and stuff. So, you, you know, I don't know what the thoughts are there for, for that, but uh, the, the, we, get, we get paid the same Medicare rate for telemedicine as we, as we do. And so there's no more to you guys, no more cost to patients. In fact, it should be, it should be cheaper if you look at the indirect cost. Of gas and time and you know like that. if your if your children have to take off work to bring you in or something like that you know if you live alone. And did you have one more question? Yes. How much more prevalent is Parkinson's in this area than the general population? Um. And, and you mean in Moses Lake or you mean in Eastern Washington or? Both. Um, not, not really any more prevalent. <coughs> I mean, for the longest time, we had really thought that rural areas had higher rates of Parkinson's. And a paper came out about two or three years ago that uh, made a pretty strong argument that people in urban areas have higher rates of Parkinson's than those in rural areas. So uh, I, I have not seen anything real convincing one way or the other to show that there's real geographic hotspots, except for if there's more older people in an area, there's going to be more Parkinson's. So in Boca Raton and Florida, whatever, those areas. Thank you. Thank you. Good questions. Uh, Pendleton, Oregon. We have one and no questions. Thank you for being there today. Richland. And they might have already closed up their room. Okay. Tenasket, North Valley Hospital. Yes, I had a question or two. Um, Parkinson's disease is increasing. Is that re just related to the growth of the uh, population of the elder, older, the old, old, or? Yeah, it's related to that. This re okay, yeah, is it just related to aging or some other factor? Is that the question? Yes. Yeah. A, a big part of it is that there's a lot of baby boomers getting older, and uh, that's definitely a, a big part of seeing more people with Parkinson's. And, and the other uh, thing about uh, seeing more Parkinson's is uh, we're, we're detecting it better now than we did in the past. Uh, in the, in the, a lot of people with Parkinson's, you'll hear that they had family members with essential tremor or that, that had, had some shaking. And, they, you know, if you develop Parkinson's tremor and you're 85 years old and, you know, it progresses slowly and you die when you're 90 from, you know, cancer or something it's not going to be thought of as parkinson's you know 50 years ago we just thought of it as the shakes tremor uh -huh. so now we give it a name we say it's parkinson's and we have support groups and so you know you kind of becomes part of your identity at some point that that's kind of you know p part of part of what you have to deal with and everyone knows so i think the, the, the other big part of it is uh, a uh a, just a, a diagnosis bias or just just we're identifying identifying people and it's uh, sticking because it's the correct diagnosis. So we're just better at, better at making a diagnosis now than we were 
40, 50 years ago. Okay, thank you. And it looks like the last one I have uh, logged in is Walla Walla. We have two people I have no questions. It's a good talk. Oh, thank you. Okay, my local people have any questions then? Okay, Cindy, we have 22 in Spokane, and do we have any questions? I'm a simple-minded person, so I'm going to speak with you so you can hear me. I'm going to give my message, you, but uh, from a practical point of view, yeah. we call May, your office, we call Megan, or we call Charlotte, and we make an appointment to be on the Internet. If, if I were so Yes, if you're in a health provider shortage area. Yes, exactly. So, so for example, you know, if you like, you wanted to try this out and you heard it, you, you heard about this, you would go to one of our, you would call the office and say, uh, yes, I, I heard about Dr. Aldridge's tele or the Northwest Modular Telemedicine Program, and I'd like to participate in that. And then uh, we would look and see which site you're nearest and uh, schedule you for that site. So they schedule you a time. Yeah, just like any other doctor's visit. The whole idea here is to be minimally disruptive, to make it as much like a regular clinic visit as possible. Okay, so you, you sit in an office, empty office, and wait for them to come on screen? Yeah, so that's a great that's a great point. I didn't. There's actually a couple of things that are happening behind the scenes here that you're not seeing. I think you guys saw Brian in the control room there. He's listening to our conversation now, big brother. But no, no, it's uh, – it's, uh, he um, – uh, is there kind of operating that, that screen. So you dial in and I dial in to a room, a waiting room, and then we're connected there remotely. So really, uh, you go to the far end site. Uh, I forget it. At uh, several of the places, it's um, uh, one place is a conference room that they're not using. Another place, I believe, it's a room next to the ER. Here we go. A medicine machine in the ER. Telescope. And then two other ones. I'll turn this off. If I know what the volume is. The idea is to come to this because they, they kind of ask, well, how do you want this done? What, how do you want it done? Like, well, let's do whatever is the easiest for the far end site. Because if you start uh, placing the requirements on people, you have to have this, you have to have that, you have to have that. They're not going to want to do it. I mean, my whole idea here is to make this so that it's doable, so that they'll be interested and want to go for this. And so it's been more dictated by what they have set up at the far end. I just wanted – the only thing I want – is I want to be virtually in Colville. I want to be virtually in Othello. So whatever it takes to make that happen, technology is so simple. All, all we have to do is to just say, 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 like, what do you already have there, and we'll work with you. So it's actually different in different places, and I think that's kind of a good thing because, you, you know, with the, some of the bigger hospital systems, they kind of only know all one way. And this, we're able to kind of do things based on how they want to do it, and and it just works. It's been working so far better that way. Okay, we have this uh, uh, prevalence of um, Parkinson's in China is double that of U.S. Yeah. Was what I was interested in is what is uh, the prevalence in different ethnic communities. And, and the, what and is the research in that area? And the, so. Yeah. So the the, pre, the question is, what is the prevalence of uh, Parkinson's in different ethnic communities? Um, in um, in African Americans, it's thought to be uh, lower numerically, but there's a significant there's um, there almost certainly is a significant uh, lack of access to care for African Americans. It is probably the reason for that number being lower. Um, Asian Americans is uh, this is again this is all U.S. based. So Asian Americans is uh, slightly lower, um, and I want to say uh, Latino? in Latinos I think it's probably the lowest, but it's not that much lower. I mean these are I think it's significantly lower in Latinos, but it's still there's still a lot of of Latinos with uh, with with PD. So it's mainly because of the healthcare disparities that we see lower incidence in African American communities. But is that same also in Latino communities too, or no? Yeah, yeah. Uh, typically, I mean, la la uh, you know, lack of access to care is a huge, a huge um, social problem in in the U.S. for for different for different groups. And and I think you see it, it's more a problem in certain areas than it is others, but. 
And my second question was around, you mentioned about in Netherlands, they have the MDT approach, a multidisciplinary mm -hmm. team approach to keep individuals with Parkinson's to remain in home. Can you elaborate more on that and what yeah. we can learn to do so, here? So, so kind of a, this, in the Netherlands, they have a, kind of a virtual comprehensive care team. And comprehensive care, so multidisciplinary comprehensive care for Parkinson's has been shown to improve patient satisfaction, decrease hospitalization, and overall people that have multidisciplinary care seem to have better insight into their condition, kind of know what they shouldn't do, know what they can do, and push themselves in good ways. Um, and so previously where I was, I was in uh, housed under one large multi-specialty group where we kind of did a, a program like that. And we're actually working right now in the process of working with St. Luke's to, to create that same type of thing here in Spokane. So we've got a couple of meetings in the next few months with St. Luke's to make that happen. As far as making that virtual, I think it's fascinating. I think you're definitely going to see that. Again, the, the big limitation here is payers. It's so like anything else. It's like if, if insurance would pay for it, which they don't, they're, they're loath to pay for. And, you know, you have to see their point of view, sort of. Um, they're, they're, they're loath to pay for anything else on addition to what they're already paying, which they feel like is too much. But, but the idea is that, you know, you would kind of see a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, a speech therapist, you know, maybe at different points, maybe finish those therapies in sequence if you're struggling with multiple functional daily issues. Kind of see them in sequence and kind of get signed off. And, and it's not going to be the same necessarily as coming into a clinic visit uh, with a physical therapist. It's probably, I don't know, I mean, I'd go so far as to say it's probably not quite as good. But there's still a lot that, that can be gained. And again, Parkinson's is very visual. So you can see a lot of this stuff. One of the other barriers is liability, medical liability. And so what happens if you're doing something remotely and a person falls? You know, are you therefore, as a physician, doing an exam, are you therefore liable? Well, it's honestly not completely worked out. All I can say is that I do carry a, I do carry a rider for that, specifically in my uh, uh, medical uh, malpractice coverage for that. Um, you know, and I think it's not something, it sounds kind of silly, but I mean, you have to take it seriously because, you, you know, you can never tell. Um, so th I, I think there are some real barriers there medically, legally that, that have to get worked out too because uh, you want people to be safe. Definitely, you know, when they're doing that, and they're probably they're definitely safer doing it in a physical therapy studio or, or clinic room. But at the same time, if they're not doing any physical therapy, are they really? Is it safer to do nothing? It's just like the patient that's in the wheelchair. Well, stay in the wheelchair. You're safer that way. Yes, <laughs> but is that really? So is that, in other words, what kind of risk can you tolerate with telemedicine? Because it, it comes up. It, it always comes up. Even even the asynchronous telemedicine we're doing with Nigeria, it still comes up there. Or still, even as benign as that sounds, you still have to think about it. So, j again, just to bring up a couple of things that, yes, I, I think that, that uh, virtual conference of care should happen. I think there's a lot of good reasons to why we, it should be pushed for, but there's a couple of big barriers there. I'm working with a guy. He's a professor at University of Washington in bioinformatics, and we're looking at starting something kind of like that. It would be just a separate, just a fee basis thing, and you know, don't get insurance involved and make it somewhat reason, you know, reasonable for patients. But it would be something kind of like that. So there's definitely, I think you'll see things like that in the near future uh, in the virtual world. In addition to wanting to see that, you know, in your own communities, I think having a comprehensive care team is a, a very good thing. This whole idea of that, you know, the doctor knows all there is about Parkinson's and can just guide you through this and uh, unscathed. I think that's, that's not really accurate anymore. We really need to draw on the expertise of PT, OT, speech, uh, massage therapist, you know, wh whatever, chiropractors, whatever someone's told me that they've gotten help with, I like to try to bring them into the fold. So, very good. Uh, Cindy, this uh, is Mel City Chester again. A project you're working on be completed and so that you missed us. And there were 10. Connect Parkinson's, our last Connect Parkinson patient should be enrolled uh, and completed probably next summer. And so we'll publish it in the next two years. It's about how long it takes things to get published. And we'll see. Then, then it's up to our, our legislatures. So they'll definitely get working on that quickly. 
and on can the happen. end of that, as far as the legislature, there's things being worked on right now. If you call your local representative, and I'm the Parkinson's Action Network is a really great place to go find out yep. what they're working on with telemedicine and who you can call. Like for us, you can call Kathy McMorris Rogers' office and say that telemedicine is important to our care. Um, it's part of the PAN network, and if you have questions about that, I can get you information. But they're working on that as part of the process that they're in Washington, D.C. But really quick, uh, Miles City, Montana, I didn't have you checked off. I apologize for skipping you. Um, I heard that you had 10 people there. Did you have a question? No, we didn't have any questions. Thank you for making sure that we got you, and thank you for being there today. Thank, thank you. you. Hello, this is Pullman. We have three people here. All right. Hi, Pullman. Hi. Did you have a question? She's talking to Pullman. No questions from Pullman. Uh, the, just this Sunday, there was an article in New York Times about telemedicine being approved of uh, Washington State. In she said, can I come in? What happened? Do they have questions? Sorry. Uh, we're, if, Pullman, I'm sorry. We're having a little trouble with the audio. Did you have a question uh, there? The question is, if you live in Idaho, can you travel to one of the sites in Washington State, see the doctor by uh, telemedicine, telemedicine, and then have it covered by the insurance? Yes. Yay. Bye. Good question. Uh, so I was just wondering, in light of what our Washington state legislators have passed, uh, you know, about telemedicine, can that be applied to, uh, as far as the uh, people who are Medicaid eligible, at least? I, I don't, um, I don't know. I didn't see the details of that for Washington State. Could you tell us a little bit more about it? Uh, because in this New York Times article, mm -hmm. they were talking about that uh, Governor Inslee has signed you know, telemedicine uh, as one of the interventions that would be covered. Mm -hmm. And you have to go to one of the clinics. It cannot be done from home. It was shared in that article. It yeah. isn't just this past Sunday's uh, New York Times. Yeah, so there's there's really lots of interest. And I think we'll just see more of this as it catches on more with the larger hospital systems. There'll probably be more of a driver than a small clinic. We're just trying to drive it within the Parkinson's community. But but it's only going to be easier the, the more... If you want to help these things along, go for a telemedicine visit next time you stub your toe and just see what it's like. I mean, I don't know, something like that maybe if it's feasible. Because I think there's – Providence is offering some kind of virtual visit or something like that with urgent care. I saw something on TV not long ago about that. But I think it's a Providence system. I don't. I can't remember exactly. I'm pretty sure it's them. Okay, well, you'll be hearing more about this in the future, and we're going to start out with our four sites and try to do a really good job there, and uh, we want to do that first, do four sites well, and then roll it out to other uh, places in the region, but Tenasket would be definitely be one, and, um, you know, we, we've got a clinic down in Pullman, and so somewhere out around there, and then, of course, Montana and Idaho, other places nearby Oregon. I've had a license in Oregon previously, but I don't have it anymore, and I still have a license in Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, so... I don't know if you want me to read it really fast, but again, you got to love the internet. Washington State gave a victory to the industry in April when Governor Inslee, a Democrat, signed legislation requiring insurers to cover a range of telemedicine services, telemedicine services if they are already covered those services when provided in person. But the new law, which made Washington the 24th state to ensure reimbursement for some telemedicine services, does not cover virtual urgent care outside a medical facility. Um, let's see, but it opens the door with a lot of our payers um, for virtual health services and um, it looks like some, cover, some insurance co are covering virtual urgent care. So it looks like services are, like you had mentioned, are covered, but the virtual urgent care, but it's just a process of getting everything covered. Yeah, it's very piecemeal. It's not like the, the Canadian system has opted for a very overarching, comprehensive kind of minimal regulation approach, and so we just have a lot of 
kind of regulation, medical legal barriers, and other things uh, that you know are, are right now preventing us from being more widespread. But, I, but again, my hope is that down the road, 30 years from now, we won't call it telemedicine or teleneurology. We'll just call it neurology or doctor's visits, and we won't think anything of it. Like you don't really even realize now if you go in in the middle of the night, the headache, and get a CAT scan read, or even our even all of our DAT scans, all of our DAT scans that we do for Parkinson's, which we don't do that many, but we, we do some if we're uncertain about a diagnosis to try and prove that it's true Parkinson's. Uh, all those are read out of Seattle, actually, wow. inland, outsourced, could, wisely, because we don't have to order that many of them, and there's only one guy there in all Seattle that reads them. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us for telehealth. Um, and next month we are doing uh, for telehealth, it's a PD 101. It's going back to the basics of Parkinson's. Um, it, what we would like our community to do is to invite those that are newly diagnosed or family members who would like to come and learn more about Parkinson's. Uh, it's just, again, it's going to be a very basic back to what Parkinson's is and go over uh, medications and things like that. But we're just trying to thank you, Dr. Aldrin. Educate our community and thank you everybody for joining us.